Okay, good morning. I think we have pretty much a quorum. Thanks for joining us again for this session in Innovations in Diabetes and Cardiovascular Health. Next slide, please, Rick. So a reminder, as always, not to disclose any private health information during your case discussions. Next slide. Uh, this is These are the general reminders about um, help, both technical help and with the actual series, and our usual slide about cardio and today's presentations. So uh, today we will hear from Dr. Werner, who will be talking about plant-based diets. We have two really interesting cases from Amber and Sarah as well. And Jim and Chris will be our lead discussants for those. So Jim, whenever you're ready. Oh, disclosures, uh, no change from last week. Great, thank you, Deltham. So today I'm gonna to talk with you about plant-based diets and uh, Gotham and I, uh, about five years ago, started a weight management clinic at University Hospitals. And since then, we've worked with many hundreds of patients. Probably the biggest challenge is uh, helping patients improve the quality of their diets for weight loss and cardiometabolic health as well. So today, uh, what I would like to do is define a plant-based diet, list the benefits, and describe uh, some practical approaches for introducing patients to plant-based diets. So uh, diet is of great importance for health. It's the leading predictor of health outcomes globally, of total chronic disease risk, of premature death, uh, and uh, most relevant to our card Cardio Echo series here is a leading risk factor for cardiovascular disease, type two diabetes, and obesity. And the drivers of this are diets that are high in sodium, uh, low in whole grains, fruits, vegetables, nuts, and seeds, and omega-3 fatty acids. So this has been well established. So every five years, the, the uh, USDA, in collaboration with uh, Health and Human Services, develops dietary guidelines for Americans. So what they do is they look at the scientific evidence uh, for what is a healthy diet, and then uh, it is a political process of, of formulating guidelines that has heavy uh, influence from industry as well as uh, academics. And uh, even so, these guidelines have been uh, criticized in some ways as being a bit watered down. Uh, but even so, uh, Americans are scoring about 58 points out of 100 on average for the quality of their diet. And I think what's most disturbing is the, the, the uh, age group with the lowest dietary quality is from age five to age 18. Uh, right when uh, people or uh, kids are formulating their dietary habits and preferences. Next slide. So uh, just as an example, leading vegetables in American diet are potatoes and tomatoes. Potatoes because of French fries and potato chips. Tomatoes because of uh, uh, um, tomato, so uh, tomato paste uh, that is an ingredient in pizza sauce and in school lunches. So really uh, one of the big culprits here is ultra processed foods. Uh, these are formulations of food that is taken and highly processed and mixed with things like emulsifiers and stabilizers and um, uh, preservatives, not to mention fat, sugar, and salt. And so we have things, common, uh, common foods in our, our diets are pizza, soda, fast foods, et cetera. And these are significantly associated with obesity and cardiometabolic disorders and cancer as well. This currently comprises more than half, 57% of energy intake for the average American. Uh, and for those of us born over uh, past 1950, which is probably almost everyone here, uh, we've been steeped in marketing and advertising. And these foods have been very widely available. And this is of course increased uh, as time has gone on and our preferences and eating habits have been shaped by all of this. Next slide. Another uh, problematic uh, component of the American diet for many people is an excess of animal-based foods uh, that can uh, cause uh, too much saturated fat in the diet, dietary cholesterol. 73% of antibiotic use worldwide is in uh, livestock. So uh, there are, I think, 35,000 deaths a year in the U.S. from antibiotic-resistant bacteria, uh, and that has been linked to animal-based food consumption. 
uh, in milk products, uh, insulin-like growth factor is a problem uh, from cattle that have been treated with uh, recombinant uh, bovine somatotropin to increase milk production. And this has been linked to cancer. Uh, heme iron has been linked to be uh, or associated with uh, both cardiovascular risk and cancer as well. And then products that uh, result from cooking meat products, like uh, the uh, aromatic hydrocarbons and heterocyclic amines uh, have been linked to cancer, at least in animals. And then L-carnitine and choline from uh, meat products are, con are converted in the liver to TMAO, and that is strongly linked to cardiovascular disease as well. So some animal products are uh, acceptable on the diet for, uh, for the most part, but an excess can be a real problem. So overall though, for the American consumer, really inconsistent messages, uh, what to believe uh, and what to, to think about what to eat is very difficult to ascertain. So, you know, if you think of saturated fat as being accepted years ago as part of American diet, then it was vilified and now it's okay again, or maybe it's not okay again. So uh, people don't really know how to sort this out. It is complex for anyone, uh, let alone people with perhaps low health literacy to try to figure out what is a healthy pattern of eating. We also have underfunding of nutrition research and um, in science, the journal Science a few years ago, a commentator said advice on what constitutes a healthy diet is more prevalent and more inconsistent than ever. So despite um, all the uh, talk about diet, there doesn't seem to be in the minds of the average American, a real clear message on exactly how to eat. Next slide. Nevertheless, there is a scientific consensus, a clear consensus on an optimal pattern of eating for most people. And this uh, phrase was coined by Michael Pollan, the author, and that is eat food, not too much, mostly plants. Uh, there is the caveat though, there's no single best diet for everyone and specific health problems do often require specialized diets. Next slide. So just as uh, the title says here, plant-based diets are mostly plants, uh, nutrient dense plant foods. And one of the, the take home messages from today uh, is that really we wanna maximize the quality of diet so that it's high in nutrient density, but low in calorie density. So ultra processed foods are just the opposite of this. They're high in calorie density, so they're high in calories, but low in nutrients. Uh, so not getting uh, 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 the nutrients that are, are required in the diet and also very low in fiber. So 97% of Americans are deficient in fiber on, on a daily basis. And that is a big part of satiety and also healthy microbiome uh, and so forth for health. Um, so next slide. So mostly fruits, vegetables, whole grains, legumes, uh, nuts, seeds, and uh, plant-based diets oftentimes have water as the only beverage, which is uh, for adults, for most adults, unless there's a specific health issue, uh, the only beverage that adults need. Uh, and so it very importantly though, may include fish, meats, eggs, and dairy in, in certain amounts. Uh, next slide. So plant-based diets are the diets that you're probably very familiar with. You may not have thought of them as plant-based diets, but uh, the Mediterranean diet, the DASH diet, the recommendations from the American Heart Association, the WHO, even the USDA's MyPlate is 75% plant-based foods and vegetarian and vegan diets uh, that don't fit under the categories of Mediterranean or DASH or, or other diets with specific names uh, are also plant-based diets. And I'll talk about each of these uh, uh, a little bit here. Next slide. So there is really strong evidence for the Mediterranean diet being effective uh, in, uh, in protecting health. There's 30% reduced risk of cardiovascular disease events uh, for those on Mediterranean diet versus controls. Uh, in a lot, this is a large study of over 7,000 individuals over five years. Diabetes incidence was 40% lower in one uh, version of the Mediterranean diet. 
and also saw significant improvements in blood pressure and insulin sensitivity in lipids, uh, reduced inflammation, et cetera. Next slide. The DASH diet uh, focuses on fruits, vegetables, whole grains, and lean meats. It was really designed initially to improve blood pressure by reducing sodium, uh, but it's done, it, it has far more benefits than, than that. So systolic blood pressure is significantly improved in many studies of the DASH diet, and also uh, appears to significantly protect against cardiovascular diseases, uh, coronary heart disease, stroke, even heart failure, and may reduce cancer risk as well. So these have been studied uh, pretty extensively and found to be uh, protective, and they do emphasize plant foods in the diet. So then we have this taxonomy that uh, you may be familiar with, uh, ranging from one end at the top of the left column, vegan and whole foods, vegan diets, to uh, through various vegetarian diets, including dairy products and eggs in varying amounts, or fish, the pescatarian diet, and then finally the flexitarian diet, where that is primarily plant-based foods but occasionally uh, animal-based products are consumed as well. Next slide. So uh, looking at evidence for supporting uh, these diets for protecting cardiovascular health, uh, vegetarian and vegan diets have been associated with 28% lower uh, coronary uh, heart disease risk incidence and uh, protective against mortality also. And um, what's interesting too about these studies is there's a lot of heterogeneity, as you saw in that spectrum of uh, vegetarian and vegan diets. Even so, they have been found to be significantly protective. Uh, the Adventist 2 study is a, a large cohort study that's been going on for many years of vegetarians versus uh, non-vegetarians, finding that the prevalence of hypertension is significantly lower in plant-based groups. And lipids are generally lower as well, though. HDL is, is lower oftentimes, but the ratio of HDL and LDL is healthy. So overall blood lipids are lower, significantly lower. Also diabetes risk is reduced um, by about 27% in vegetarians versus non-vegetarians. And uh, these diets really shine as well with BMI. Typically vegans and vegetarians have the lowest BMIs. And in the Adventist Health Study that compared number of variations of uh, diet, dietary patterns. The only uh, dietary pattern that was associated with a healthy BMI was a vegan diet in that particular study. Uh, so um, there was also a six month RCT that was done recently looking at whole foods, vegan diets uh, versus controls and found that after six months, there was a uh, weight loss, a mean weight loss of almost 10 pounds in the whole foods plant-based diet versus about a little less than half a pound in the control group. Uh, what's interesting about this is that this was ad libitum. So uh, the participants were instructed to eat as much as they wanted to eat to satiety because uh, plant-based foods have so much fiber and water in them. People can fill up uh, the stomach and fill up the, uh, the diet, their uh, uh, digestive tract uh, with high fiber foods, plant-based foods, and become uh, satisfied eating as much as they want and still lose weight because of that low calorie density and high nutrient density. Uh, in addition to that, uh, exercise was not recommended or part of this intervention. They were just instructed to continue exercising at the level that they did. Uh, even so they were able to achieve this level of weight loss. So there are some nutrient concerns in plant-based diets for those that are entirely plants in particular, uh, vitamin B12 supplementation is, is required in vegan diets and, uh, and also can be uh, concerns about calcium and iron, zinc, uh, vitamin D supplementation is often recommended. Omega-3 fatty acids um, from uh, animal products are, if they're in low, in low amounts, uh, then they can be supplemented with uh, algae-based omega-3 fatty acids or with fish oil. Uh, and protein, although protein, true protein deficiency 
uh, is, is a very rare thing in the US. Uh, protein amounts, protein consumption is usually significantly lower on uh, plant-based diets. And for people who um, are muscle mass is an issue for them, um, may need to supplement with additional protein. Even so, um, American Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics says that vegetarian, including vegan diets, are appropriate for all stages of the life cycle, including pregnancy and so forth. Uh, so that's reassuring. Next slide. So there are many health benefits as I've already discussed, and I don't think I probably need to go into these. Next slide. So what, you know, a very important take home message as well is really about dietary quality. That's really what it gets to. So in the nurses health study of almost 117,000 individuals, they found that those that were eating uh, a plant-based diet that's high in whole grains, fruits, vegetables, nuts, legumes, et cetera, so a high quality plant-based diet, they did reduce their risk of cardiovascular disease by 25% and diabetes risk by 44% after BMI adjustment, uh, which is a you know, very, very significant cardiometabolic benefits. However, for those that had unhealthy or low quality plant-based diets, thinking that they're probably improving their health and uh, avoiding excess animal products and emphasizing plant-based eating, if it was high in refined grains and fruit juice, potatoes, desserts, sugar-sweetened beverages, and there are many vegetarian and vegan foods now that are highly processed as well. We see a lot of younger people who transition to these diets who eat those kinds of foods uh, regularly rather than, than whole unprocessed foods. So we're getting back to uh, ultra-processed foods in the form of vegan foods as well now, uh, as the uh, industry has come in and begun to um, make those kinds of foods available to people. They had significantly increased risk of cardiovascular disease that by 32% increase and 15% increased risk of type 2 diabetes. So they were actually increasing their risk of cardiometabolic problems because of low dietary quality. So this is a really important message, I think, for patients who want to eat this way. Um, and I think another important thing uh, to communicate to patients is whether it's the Mediterranean diet, DASH diet, or some version of a vegan or, or vegetarian diet, uh, and, and I deal with this with our patients, is that it, um, it sounds, some of these sound like the way the standard American diet is currently. It's just a little bit different in that there's a little bit less of this and a little bit more of that. And if people kind of go away with that in mind, they go, oh, I need to eat a, a little bit more fruit. I need to uh, try to eat a little more vegetables. Uh, then, and then that is a good place to start. But if they end there, they really haven't made much of a difference. Uh, when in fact, really the, where we'd like people to be is, is significantly different and have significantly higher quality diet than the standard American diet. Uh, so it really is a matter of working with patients consistently over time to help them make those changes progressively and incrementally so they continue to improve their diet uh, up to a point where, you know, as a clinician, you're satisfied with what you're seeing uh, with, their, with their test results, as well as patients being satisfied with how they're eating. Next slide. So uh, a good guide, I think, uh, if you're looking for something to read uh, for clinicians would be uh, this particular article that talks uh, about the range of different uh, healthy plant-based options. It also talks about the, uh, the problems, as I mentioned, with the standard American diet. So uh, this, will, this, this slide set will be on the Cardio uh, Echo website if you're interested in any of these references. Next slide. So uh, helping patients get started. So patients we see in the clinic will come in oftentimes, uh, our, our average patient has a BMI over 40. They would like to lose 60, 70, 80 pounds. Um, and uh, that is what's bringing them in to see us is that motivation. But just a five to 10% weight loss is really a good place to start. And it is a clinic, clinically meaningful target as well. Uh, and patients, not only do you notice, patients notice this, uh, say, in their 
lipids, lipids level uh, is changing and improving, but weight is differentially lost around the midsection. So patients actually see uh, that uh, their clothes are fitting a little bit differently. And that seeing progress is what really motivates patients to continue and excites patients and brings them back. Uh, so uh, I would recommend uh, the opening the door technique to begin these conversations about weight in particular. This was uh, developed by Gotham and his colleagues years ago. And there's a, a detailed explanation of this method uh, in the weight management series, ECHO, if you're interested in learning more about this, how, how to begin these conversations. Um, and then uh, these conversations often then go into eliciting the patient's motivation again. The more we can hear the patient talk about why they wanna change, the more likely they are to change. It's change talk. So simply using open questions um, to elicit the patient's motivation and talk about that with them and let them convince you as to why they need to change and want to change, which patients are usually very motivated to talk about. So the more we can get them to talk about that, discuss that, think about that, uh, the better it is and the more likely they are to take action. Uh, we can use ask, tell, ask, or elicit, provide, elicit, motivational interviewing technique to provide information to patients about these diets, um, identify action steps and use SMART goals. And then what's really key is revisiting at subsequent visits. And I think that's what, uh, why we see really good effectiveness of clinician counseling for, with patients uh, about health behavior change and diet, it, it is the, uh, the repeated visits uh, and that relationship that's developed and trust, of course, uh, but repeating, uh, uh, re revisiting this conversation on a regular basis and helping patients make those changes longitudinally and uh, really just kind of a, abiding with them as they work through this and make these changes slowly and incrementally for most people. Some people want to do this all at once and they do, but that's pretty rare. Next slide. Okay, so you know, dietitians are, are experts uh, on diet and uh, but with uh, over 70% of Americans now uh, overweight or obese and uh, having uh, cardiometabolic comorbidities as well, we certainly can't refer every patient to a dietitian. Uh, so uh, being equipped to be able to manage or uh, counsel patients in, in the exam room is, is a very important skill set. And also, um, you know, many uh, health systems have weight management programs. Uh, the cardiac rehabilitation programs, uh, the Dean Ornish program, which is a plant-based eating program is funded by Medicare. Uh, so fo folks in cardiac rehab can participate in that program. And then other support sources like health coaches, personal trainers, uh, community health workers can be fantastic uh, sources of support. Next slide. So there is really good information for patients out there for the Mediterranean diet from American Heart Association and the DASH diet from NHLBI. Uh, so these are good resources that you can direct patients to that are very uh, sound and reliable. And there's also uh, some good resources like the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine on uh, getting patients started and moving in a plant-based direction. And uh, of course, cooking courses, books and DVDs at our libraries. Libraries have extensive sections for, uh, uh, about different diets, healthy diets like these diets, as well as recipes. And then it can be helpful for patients to just become more enthusiastic about making these changes by seeing documentaries. Uh, and that's how a lot of patients have actually begun uh, that whole process is by learning about it through uh, these kinds of uh, media outlets. And then um, different kinds of initiatives have been started like Meatless Mondays from Johns Hopkins. And uh, that's a good place to start is just simply uh, choosing even not even one entire day, but even one meal per week and learning how to uh, incorporate more plant-based foods and uh, replace animal-based products and highly processed foods, ultra processed foods. And then that can be repeated every week. That can be then increased to more days for that particular meal. Uh, additional meals uh, can be added 
through the day and patients can incrementally make these changes. So peer and community support is also really important. Uh, we have, uh, you know, uh, most, most uh, communities, larger communities at least, have access to uh, the, um, uh, di the, the diabetes uh, self-management programs, uh, like the program from Stanford is in many, many YMCAs. It's also in many health systems. We have programs like Strides, which emphasize uh, both healthy eating and diet. So these are great resources that hospitals often have access to. And then weight management programs that create communities. It's not hard to create these kinds of communities because patients do want support. Uh, in our program, we have two evening support groups per week. We have an active Facebook group that was started by patients. And then we get together for walks uh, on a monthly basis. Uh, so creating communities is so helpful for patients to get that peer support. Uh, it's, I'm finding it's one thing for me to talk about uh, these issues with patients. It's another thing, uh, it has a, a completely different impact when patients can talk to other patients who have made these changes and seen significant improvements. Uh, so that peer support is really important. There are lots of communities on Facebook. Uh, I saw more than 50 uh, Facebook groups for the Mediterranean diet, for example, and for the DASH diet too. Uh, some of them very large groups that are curated uh, by experts. Uh, so it's good information. And then a lot of smaller groups that are just kind of fringe groups that I don't know about the quality of those. So you could you know, uh, suggest to patients that they find the larger groups that are curated if they're interested in joining a virtual community about uh, whatever diet they're interested in. And then we should also keep in mind that, you know, many cultures, depending on how far you go back, if you go back certainly more than 10,000 years before agriculture existed, uh, have plant-based traditions. And so what we see um, uh, in the African-American community, just for example, a really, a really vital community of plant-based chefs and bloggers and cookbook authors, social media influencers, and uh, across uh, the U.S. population, the, the segment with the greatest uh, percentage of vegans actually has been shown to be African Americans. Uh, surprising, but uh, true. Next slide. So plant-based diets have um, significant benefits and mortality and sustainable weight management, reducing the risk of chronic diseases uh, and severity of chronic diseases and re reducing reliance on medication as well. Okay, that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jim. Um, I just wanna follow up with a comment about African-Americans and vegan diets. I had a student who was African-American and grew up in Oakland, California. He's a practicing physician now. And his research project was me with me was looking at the historical context of African Americans and dining and cooking. And of course, it's no secret that a lot of cooks in the 1920s and 30s were African American. The largest catering companies in big cities like Philadelphia and Baltimore were run by African Americans. The other thing pointed out is the 1920s and 30s, the African American diet was almost entirely plant based, a time when there was almost no diabetes, no obesity, and very little heart disease among anybody, not just African Americans. And it's largely been marketing and manipulation of the food supply that that has led to the significant problems we have now. So I think it's almost a way of framing it in terms of social justice. And when you mention that to people and then people read about it, and he's written a little bit about this, I think it gets people motivated to switch the way that they eat, that's for sure. Any, any questions for Jim before we move on to um, uh, the uh, case studies? Thank you, Jim, that was fabulous. Question? I oh, I, Nathan, I, go ahead. I had a question specifically regarding the goal weight loss of being like around five to 10% to notice clinical changes. I've told people that, you know, the, the pace in which that should occur should, you know, to set the expectation that it should be long-term, you know, like say for example, over six to six months to 12 months, you know, say for example, we're trying to lose a pound or so a month and kind of setting, for example, um, you know, like a, a, a two to 300 uh, calorie deficit per day to achieve said goal. But I was just kind of wondering if there's any literature saying specifically, you know, if there's benefit to get there, you know, earlier than, than later, uh, and if that, you know, has any ramification on how you would counsel, counsel a patient. 
Um, I can comment on that, Nate. So, I mean, the, the, the saying in our clinic is the slower it comes off, the longer it stays off. So I don't know if it's the pace. It's the problem is if somebody loses 30 pounds in three or four months, they probably, they're probably doing something that's unsustainable. And we see that a lot. And people gain and lose over the course of, of their lives, so, um, you know, 12 to 1500 pounds for a lot of our clients over the course of their lives that they've lost and regained. And it's because they're pursuing keto or they're doing something very unusual. They, you know, who knows what happened and that's not sustainable. But if you are only reducing your daily intake by two or 300 calories, you're probably just avoiding a couple of unhealthy habits that you have then adopted and your weight steadily goes down. So, so I think that's, that's the key thing to keep in mind. Any other questions? I'm going to turn things back to Claire for a moment. Um, yep. So just a quick reminder, you should have the survey from today's talk in your inbox um, from about 15 minutes ago. We appreciate if you just take a second to fill that out um, to give us feedback, and then we still need cases. So if anyone's interested in presenting, um, let me know, and I can send you the right link. Okay, thank you, Claire. Thanks, everyone. I'm going to plunge right into my lengthy study section that starts in about two minutes. So um, have a wonderful uh, day. Enjoy the rest of your week, and we'll see you next week. Bye-bye.